Et euh, merci. Thank à... you for those who've been with us uh, since the first session, and thank you very much for your participation. We uh, are uh, very moved by your interest, by your faithfulness, uh, and uh, this uh, encourages us to move ahead, uh, as well as the uh, financial support of our partners, the ACP Secretariat, the European Union, the uh, UN, and bilateral uh, cooperation partners. We thank you all for uh, your commitment for your participation in our initiatives and for supporting uh, uh, the uh, knowledge management. My name is uh, Fatah Ben uh, Rejeb. I am the executive secretary of uh, PAFO, Pan-African uh, Farmers Organization, covering the whole of the African uh, continent. Uh, and uh, this uh, PAFO is re uh, represented by the four uh, the five uh, regional farmer uh, networks in Africa. On behalf of uh, President Bafo members, on behalf of our partner, Kole ACP, we would like to welcome you to this uh, sessions on innovation, organizing the framework of the uh, Kole ACP Bafo uh, partnership. These are two hour appointments that we have on a bi-monthly basis, and on the occasion of which we uh, share uh, farmers and agro and agripreneurs' uh, best practices. Um, let's not forget that this uh, uh, session is recorded and will be disseminated online through social platforms uh, and the uh, PAFO and Colea CP web pages. And on our web pages, you'll also find the fact sheets uh, for the different companies uh, that have already taken the floor and been, uh, uh, that have been uh, uh, presented or will be presented today. We, of course, uh, urge you to react to us questions uh, via the chat uh, or the question and answer uh, tab. And we would like to invite uh, panel members and uh, participants to react, uh, to answer questions, especially those that, that are focusing on your own experiences. I will mm, gather the different questions and comments that I will sum up at the end of uh, both panels. This uh, sixth session uh, is uh, entitled Promoting Sustainable Agriculture and Agroecological Practices, uh, the uh, key role of uh, micro and uh, small and medium uh, size enterprises and farm organizations. Uh, the uh, agriculture and an environmental consequences of agriculture are not uh, uh, to be um, justified any longer. We know that uh, there are consequences on land, water, ecosystems, as well as on the, bi the biodiversity and its exhausting. We also have uh, unfair uh, wages um, mm, given to farmers, which means that these are not sustainable uh, practices. Uh, in the eyes of PAF, of the small farmers are at the very core of uh, virtual circles. Um, the president of PAF repeated that on the uh, UN summit on uh, food systems that has just been held a week ago. And you might have noticed, at least for those who have been following since the very beginning, this is a session that that was uh, uh, foreseen at the start on the 23rd, i.e. on the same day as the UN summit, reason why we postponed uh, uh, the uh, session till uh, this week. And I'll give the floor uh, to the uh, president who will uh, talk about uh, the role of uh, small uh, farmers uh, in uh, the production uh, patterns. Um, we are fighting for sustainable uh, practices. We have to modify our paradigm. And in this context, uh, even though we respect the choice made by our farmers, as each and every one of us is free to opt for their own uh, favorite uh, practices, but we need uh, to promote a healthy, sustainable farming model that promotes social equity and the economic sustainability of its practices. It should also protect indigenous knowledge, indigenous knowledge transmitted from one generation to the next. The adoption of innovative agri-practices go 
beyond innovating uh, uh, practices, but we might want to convert a few practices or reach an economy of scale with the support of our customers, our development partners and financial institutions. We'll give the floor to uh, uh, practitioners who, even though they face uh, uh, difficulties, are promoting sustainable farming practices. Uh, and before giving the floor to uh, Isolina Boto, who is um, in charge of uh, um, networks and alliances with Colea CP, I'd like to remind you that we we'll have a link to the program and uh, the biographies of the different uh, uh, speakers. Um, and I'll uh, uh, make a few comments after this first session and also give us a piece of good news. I'm very pleased to be with you uh, today. Uh, my uh, DG, uh, Jeremy Knops, as well as it was announced, uh, Elizabeth Simadala, the president of uh, PAFO, are here with uh, us as well and will take the floor uh, at uh, the end um, for some uh, concluding uh, remarks and way forward. In the meantime, very happy um, uh, Fatma said it all. So we are looking now uh, to hear some of the entrepreneurs who are very different, uh, but all contributing to this, uh, to this uh, sustainable pathway uh, in different ways, in diversification, in sustainable uh, management, uh, use uh, of efficiently uh, of uh, resources, co-creation of knowledge and so on, very complementary as it's difficult to have it all, but really they try their best. We will uh, look with them what are the drivers of their success, uh, what obstacles, of course, they face, and what kind of support they will need, and incentives, of course, of, as Fatma said, uh, to, to transition. Uh, because it needs to be done, uh, it doesn't mean it's easy. And Colecipi does its part of work supporting some of the enterprises. Some some of our members are here today, but it, we need we need all of you, and we need many partners to do that. So we will have a first panel with four um, uh, businesses, SMEs. Uh, uh, four cases uh, that we think contribute well to our uh, ag agroecological uh, uh, transition. And then we will have some uh, discussions uh, that will bring uh, insights from policy, from research, from finance, who are partners who are supporting uh, the agroecology in the second uh, panel. And then we will uh, uh, close up with, uh, with uh, Jeremy and Elizabeth. Uh, uh, some remarks. So without a major delay, uh, I introduce the first speaker is uh, from Togo, Monsieur Gustave Desogom Bakunda, directeur de Label d'Or et Judelis. Alors, euh, Monsieur Gustave, vous avez une formation en banque, en finance, mais vous avez commencé à travailler avec des producteurs d'ananas biologiques sur les règles de production. You have uh, started working on uh, with organic pineapple producers, and since 2008, you have been developing the export of Togolese tropical fruit with uh, several partners, amongst which France. In 2012, you created La Belle d'Or, a pioneer Togolese company supporting agriculture sectors along the entire value chain. You work in uh, uh, tight cooperation with uh, small farmers and cooperatives. Uh, uh, you offer training and certification in organic farming. And uh, today, La Belle d'Or has got more than 10,000 producers in 14 organic productions. You are also the chairman of the board of directors of Judelis, uh, Togo's first modern organic juice processing plant for export, as well as the country's largest organic pineapple juice processing plant. Uh, you have been awarded several uh, um, prizes by France, by Togo and other partners. We are very happy to have you with us uh, today. And I would like to thank uh, Benedict, who for long has been working with you. You're going to tell us a few words about your model and uh, the, uh, the attention you pay to the social environmental uh, wage uh, items in your session of activity. Mr. Gustav, you've got the, the floor from Togo. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, for having me. Thank you, Iselina, for giving me this opportunity of, of making this presentation. Now, I would like to uh, make this uh, presentation. I've put together a, a, a PowerPoint so that I can uh, introduce the topic in a methodical way. Let me just share my screen with you. There we are.
Wow. Right. Wonderful. I, I think you can see my screen now. This meeting got off to a good start. So I'm going to talk about Label d'Or, the gold label. You've said a few words about the company in a very uh, appropriate manner. So I would like to say or to explain what Label d'Or is. There will be a short uh, video clip, a two minute clip to, uh, you know, give you a, an idea of what Labrador is. We will give some figures. We will talk about the market. You've already mooted the matter. I will explain how we work. Uh, and in, in particular, I will explain the impact. I will say a few words about the impact of our social approach. I, I will explain how we work with the grassroots I will say a, a few words about uh, our environmental policy. And uh, to conclude, I will introduce our new vision. Uh, to say a few, first, to explain what the uh, company is about, here's a short video clip, as I said. La Belle d'Or, as you can see, does uh, organic farming, basically, principally. 14 crops, 14 different crops. And in this short video clip, you will see the different crops or rather a number of those crops, the leading crops, you see how we work in the field on the ground with, uh, in this case, pineapples. We work with uh, a, a very good team of experts, of technicians, uh, engineers, properly trained uh, experts. They coordinate all the, the uh, activities with the producers and part of the production is uh, exported and another part goes to the plant. It's sent to the plant. Here is so soya. soya. Uh, again, we also uh, uh, process this uh, produce, organic, organic farming again. It's the same philosophy. It's the same approach. And um, from, from the seeds to exports, really, here's a new important product. Shea, uh, shea butter, uh, again, organic and fair trade approach. We, we certainly laid emphasis on, on that approach, uh, organic and fair trade. Label d'Or is a very worker-friendly work environment, uh, even for office workers, because when important operations are conducted in the field on the ground there's a centralization from our central office we have weekly meetings as you can see as you've just seen we meet and we we uh, have a brainstorming session or brainstorming sessions and we try to uh, anticipate and to put together uh, strategies for the future a few figures now for the year 2020 as you can see we have uh, two 2,300 uh, tons of, of fruits sold with uh, nearly 3,000 tons of uh, products ex are exported. This is done with the uh, an internal control system with four trained uh, technicians. They do sterling work um, in the field. We have uh, nearly 10,000 hectares. These are the 2020 figures. And just in 2020, all the producers who uh, went through the conversion process to become organic producers were about uh, nearly 4,000 producers. We have 14 different uh, crops. Uh, here they are. Well, not, not the 14, but the, the major crops. What you should see is that uh, in 2020, we certified over 24,000 tons of, product, of products in the different categories. Moving on now to the market or markets uh, since uh, 2012, when uh, Labrador was set up back in 2012, the market has evolved and we've been thinking about this and we've uh, developed a strategy and we decided to uh, uh, work with a free zone. It's part of our 2021 20, plus uh, vision because we 
are interested in exporting almost all our products to the European Union and also in part to the United States for specific products. As we said before, La Belle d'Or uh, does what we call uh, for-profit social work, for-profit social work, because the social dimension is quite important for us, but we want also to uh, make sure that uh, the operations continue. So, of course, the finance is important. We are not capitalists, but we try and work closely with the rural world. We, we try and bring them opportunities, but of course, to secure this uh, activity, we need finance. So our main objective is to inform producers on uh, the standards of organic farming, and we want to buy them their products because there is a market for those products. So we bring the market to them. In order to achieve that objective, we need to unite these producers so that they are they, they form a, 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 a single and solid front so as to face competition. Label d'Or works uh, in different areas, access to quality seeds for its network of uh, producers. Training and upskilling are crucial because if the uh, workers in the field are properly trained and if the technicians and experts are uh, skilled and go through the upskilling process, this is a guarantee for the future of our operation. And this has a major impact on our operations. In the same fashion, we also uh, take care of traceability. It's crucial. Traceability is vital for us. And uh, as part of our a 2021 plus vision, we want to uh, uh, also promote local processing of the different crops and products we are working on and we are marketing. We also have a specific environmental policy. It's part of our uh, duties. We, of course, encourage uh, uh, the workers in the field to uh, dedicate at least 1.25% of their plots to uh, 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 organic farming and, and to, uh, to trees in particular. And in our uh, plant, because we've uh, put together a plant, we've established a plant to, uh, you know, uh, use the waste and peelings from the plants. Uh, in other words, we take pineapple, pineapple waste and peelings from the plant and we uh, turn that into compost in the spirit of, a, of circular economy. And the compost then is then given back to producers. They, they can use the compost to, to fertilize their plots. In 2020, 2,500 tons of waste were, were transformed into compost. As I said before, we have a new vision. Our vision is to consolidate the entire organic value chain for our different crops and to move towards local processing including recycling. Part of the vision was materialized with uh, the setting up of a factory Judelis in 2019. We are working on uh, establishing a different Shea unit, which will uh, mobilize 5,800 5, women, women collectors to produce at least 2,000 tons of Shea butter within two years. We are already working on soya beans and this uh, a plan should be established and should uh, start operating by 2023. This is what I wanted to say about uh, La Belle d'Or. Thank you very much for your uh, kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Gustave de Sego, for, for this interesting presentation. I'm glad to see that you are, uh, you know, uh, also developing your operations on the local markets. Uh, there's a lot of competition on uh, international markets like the European market, but you are able to produce an, uh, market quality uh, products in these uh, international markets too. You talked about uh, traceability and about a number of important points. We will talk about that uh, in a moment. 
order of mango graft, you see actually uh, in the photo of Biodata, the, the other co-founder. Co and um, he actually uh, is currently uh, advising legislation for indigenous foods. Good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, Olayemi, um, good afternoon. Okay. My name is Olayemi Aganga. I am one of the co-founders of a company called Mango Craft. I have um, made a presentation on our company, so you can find out more about it, um, which I'd like to present to you um, today. Um, we are a company that started at a farmer's market in 2017. So what you're going to be seeing in this presentation um, is on our growth. Um, basically, this is Maungo Kraft. Um, next, please. Who we are and what we do. We take unique tasting, sorry, we make unique tasting artisanal small batch preserves and sauces. And we um, use indigenous African fruits, uh, typically known as orphan crops. And we basically uh, upcycle them as these fruits are typically unutilized or underutilized rather. Um, I'm sure you see that picture of that fabulous lady in the corner there, that's Martha Stewart. So since starting at a farmer's market in 2017, we actually got endorsed by Martha Stewart and we've won 13 awards, local, regional and international, including the Great Taste Awards from the Guild of Fine Foods, which are basically the Oscars of food. Um, next slide, please. Basically, we started with a um, we started with a pot and a spoon that uh, I liberated from my father's house before we started at the farmers markets. Liberated is a very uh, nice way to put it, but he's a very nice man. Um, and what we did is we started using these fruits, um, morula fruit or marula, as some people would know it. And so, a single morula tree can produce 500 kg to 1.2 tons of fruit. And that's the fruit in the video right there um, at various stages. Um, so we only use it when it's absolutely right before it ripens. And that's it right there, right when it's green. And so that is actually the grandfather of the apricot fruit that a lot of people know. And so we saw this as an opportunity to use this fruit that's in a lot of rural areas in the community and to turn it into something else. Whereas it was seen as a nuisance and attracted the snakes. Now it can make sauces and preserves and syrups. Next slide, please. And so that was in fact the problem. Here you have this nutritious fruit that in fact has eight times the vitamin C of oranges, has zinc and other oleic acids, but is going to waste typically. And so we could take that underutilized fruit and to turn it into something. But we had other problems. See. You may have heard of the marula fruit. Marula oil is actually now getting more used in the cosmetic industry, but not in the food space. But it takes about 300 tons of fruit to get to 12 tons of oil. And so we thought to ourselves, what happens to all of that fruit? And we also thought to ourselves, we as a planet have a climate change catastrophe on our hands. We have actually at the core of it, our food system. 95% of the world relies on fewer than 30 crops and fruits. That imbalance is one of the drivers of climate change. And so we wanted to reintegrate some of these fruits and uh, crops back into the food system because our planet is actually capable of producing thousands. And this gap, this absence of these fruits have made them what are now known as orphan crops. And so we wanted to reintegrate crops and fruits like marula back into the food system and view this as a climate change adaptation strategy. Next, please. So the solution, what happens to all of that fruit? We decided to form symbiotic relationships with the fruit seed oil processes I mentioned, the ones who are actually using the fruit to turn it into oil to make marula oil. So since they have all of that fruit waste, we decided to upcycle the fruit and form relationships with them, saving the nutritious fruit and turning it into um, gourmet sauces and preserves. 
helping to solve the bottleneck that the oil processes have, while also helping to reinforce and create a thousand jobs for harvesters down the value chain. But that's not all. This actually led to more linkages than even we expected. Next slide, please. This solution also led to us linking with smallhold farmers, people who grow onions, who grow green peppers, who grow carrots. And we use this to create a new value chain that actually forms part of a new green economy in Botswana, where we can help to grow the food and cosmetic sector at the same time, linking this chain into one climate change resistant value chain. Thus answering the question, what happens to all that fruit? Maungo craft? Our answer is we put our culture in a bottle. Next slide, please. So our value proposition, we upcycle the underutilized indigenous fruits such like as Murula and Moana, and we work with local smallhold farmers creating delicious small batch sauces, preserves, and actually now syrups. And we don't use any artificial preservatives. We have a unique range of flavor profiles, which are absolutely to die for. And at that stage, we also bring food diversity to the actual value system and create jobs in rural areas and improve livelihoods in this way. As we said, we put our culture in the bottom. Next slide, So, um, as you can see, we've won 13 awards, including the Great Taste Awards, which are mentioned. Our flavor profiles include things like a roasted chili, garlic, and murula um, hot sauce. And we also have things like a murula lemon and vanilla uh, jam. All of these things are reduced sugar. So we also are very conscious about health as well. And we also make other flavors like a smoked murula, chili, and ginger um, jam, which you would absolutely love on anything from ice cream to toast, or even as a marinade to chicken. I can't wait for you guys to taste our flavor profiles. They're amazing. Uh, next slide, please. But yeah, the market. The market out there quite simply is huge. The um, spreads market is an 8 billion US um, dollar market. The sauce market is a $4.3 billion market. With the sweet spreads market reigning as king, sorry, the jam and preserve market reigning as king in the spreads market, 37% of the market share, in fact, is actually yes. jam. While hot sauce is on a tear. It's amazing how fast it's actually growing. With 150% growth rate since the year 2000, the hot sauce market actually outgrows mayonnaise, barbecue sauce, and even soy sauce combined. It is something else. So what we're looking for is about 0.0013% um, of that, which would be about 1.5 US, sorry, million US dollars um, by the year 2025. And so we're not actually even really looking for that much of it. So as we grow right now, we actually are in 35 stores, um, but we are expanding even to more. We should be available on Amazon this year. Um, and we're also, uh, working right now to establish a distribution market into South Africa as well. Uh, next slide, please. So yes, our business model. We basically work with distributors in hospitality. We actually have a major uh, um, hospitality player here in Southern Africa, specifically Botswana, who we're going to be working with to expand into hospitality. Um, we also work with uh, distributors to get to retail. And also we're looking to work with distributors to get to exports as well. We also work with um, uh, marketing companies in terms of corporate gifts. So we do corporate gifts as well. So we are looking to export. We have our domestic market, which also encompasses retail and hospitality, and we do corporate gifts as well. So we're very excited about our growth in this space. Next slide, please. Ah, the team. First and foremost, we have our wonderful managing director, Bonolo Monte. She graduated cum laude from uh, UNISA. She's a Mandela Washington fellow. She has actually spoken on, um, on orphan crops at the African Union in 2019. She is on the steering committee for Generation Africa. She's United Nations food systems champion. 
and has four years experience since she first started that farmer's market with me. Um, I'm also um, part of the team. I am the head of production at Mount Craft. I have an LLB in law as a former and still in my heart attorney. And I have an LLM in intellectual property law where I gained my love and passion for the issue of traditional knowledge and geographical indicators as well. Um, I'm the head of research and development uh, for Maungo Craft and work primarily in actually uh, the kitchen side of things and developing recipes. I'm also the secretary of the Natural and Indigenous Producers Association of Botswana because of that passion as well, more on that later. And I have four years in agro-processing as well. And of course, we have our wonderful team, which are three full-time producers in staff, two content creators, and then all the different value chains that we actually work with as well, I, I view as part of our extended family. Next slide, please. What we need to grow. Well, we need equipment. We have some equipment right now. Uh, we could use technical expertise in connecting that equipment, and we can actually use more equipment. Um, statistically speaking, 70% um, of people who buy a food product have um, either tasted it themselves or had a family member or a friend recommend it to them. So we need more marketing because what we're doing right now is we're creating new markets for orphan crops that people may not actually know in the food space. So we need to develop that as well. Um, we also need more distribution because uh, quite frankly, we're looking to get into more markets. We need to purchase our inputs in bulk, um, labels, bottles, uh, shrink sleeves, things that will help us reduce and drop our costs lower. We need access to market. And as a young company as we are, growing into a space where we're really um, paying a lot of those school fees to have people find out more about this particular orphan crop and the other orphan crops we work with, we actually need financing as well. This in total will help to increase our capacity and break into new markets across Africa, in the United States, in the EU, where we um, are often told um, particularly by the German ambassador here, how much the German uh, uh, market would actually love our products. Um, the UAE, we'd like to get into all of those markets. Um, next slide, please. So thank you so much for hearing our presentation regarding Maungo Craft. Um, we, as we said, put our culture in a bottle. There's so many different spaces that our product fits into, and we look forward to sharing that with you. Uh, next slide, please. I would also like to give a mention to the Natural um, and Indigenous uh, Products Association of Botswana. What we do is we work um, uh, with partners on the ground to help improve the policy landscape and natural and indigenous um, crops, particularly because of the impact that they have on climate change and water scarcity and the issue of sustainability being so close to our hearts. So we help to improve that market framework and make the market more friendly for that environment. We also look at intellectual property issues such as geographical indicators, and we're promoting industry growth. And my own company, we work very hard in that space. And as an association, we work in that, um, uh, in that space as well. And we look forward to any future conversations with any of you, be it on the Maungo craft space or also the MTAB space. Thank you so much for your time and thank you so much for having me. Thank you very much, uh, Yemi. Um, very interesting presentation. Indeed, one of the areas that Fadma mentioned at the beginning of uh, indigenous crops and orphan crops very much underutilized, under research, and making it as the top high end uh, uh, product. Uh, in another coming session, we will look at which we do not have today that perspective because of, of time, but also at the consumers part. I mean, it's uh, you produce really amazing, I have to say, uh, uh, products out of uh, a really local, local food. Um, so I do not know now, and in the meantime, we check if Mr. Gorandiai uh, is online. I will encourage as well the speakers, you have very, very specific uh, questions and uh, uh, the question answer part. <laughs> Uh, so if you could uh, look at some of them, and I encourage as well the participants to, uh, uh, to, to put the questions already or comments or highlights in, in, the, in, the, in the chat. Uh, Monsieur Ndiaye, est-ce que, est que vous êtes prêt? S'il y avait un problème, on irait 
Mr. Ndiaye, Mr. Ndiaye, are you ready? Are you ready? If there's a problem, are you ready? I know there is a uh, connection problem from Senegal. We can move on to the next speaker. I know here with that us, you had uh, Mr. problems. Grandier. Connection problems. Are you Great. with I'll, us, Mr. Um, Gorandia? I'm going to introduce you. In the meantime, Axel is going, is going to uh, show display some slides for you. Thank you, Thank you for being here uh, from us, Senegal, Senegal, from a rural, from a rural area. area. The, uh, from the uh, farm school in Kadara. School farm called Kadara. Despite your You are here with us. You are you are the president, the president of the association called Jardin d'Afrique. You are the founder, founder of a Nagro Ecological Farm School called Kaidara. After you being a teacher, after a teaching after career, a teaching career, you decided Dakar, to train decided other to get persons, in particular the youth, to train them to agroecology. You set up a coconut, you have a coconut plantation in a village called village Kursambadia, Kursambadia to offer and alternatives to, to offer the, alternative urban, the, the rural urban exodus and to set up training for young Senegalese. For young Senegalese. And you're going, and to, you're going uh, to mention this, but uh, since 2007, the, the association and has trained dozens of young farmers at the farm school and has countries. become a reference for local like institutions. You, and you have worked in uh, collaboration worked with uh, NGOs and local authorities on co-development, which you're also going to mention. Axel and in your participation, your in your presentation, you mentioned uh, YouTube videos. Uh, you And uh, we will see excerpts of the uh, French national TV uh, news. Mr. Gorandian, you have the floor. You have 10 minutes. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Allow me to introduce myself before I get down to the nitty gritty. What happened in Senegal is that uh, uh, since the 1980s, uh, we have uh, had a big change in training in Senegal because under pressure from the IMF and uh, the World Bank, we had to cut the number of uh, civil servants and uh, universities were to be funded by the World Bank so as to develop development projects in transport, farming, uh, fisheries, etc. And this is the reason why we, we thought that uh, the training uh, was, uh, was out of touch with the needs uh, of uh, the economy. We needed a paradigm shift in Africa. Agriculture is the basis for development and farming uh, accounts for uh, the biggest number of uh, workers, especially of course in rural areas and uh, schools were uh, training people and these people no longer wanted to uh, be uh, working in the farming sector. So I thought that would be important to uh, start uh, agroecological farms, school farms, because we were trained to, to develop a conventional uh, type of farming uh, for exports only. In agroecology, we can work 12 months out of 12 months. So we needed a paradigm shift. We need to develop uh, a, uh, an efficient type of farming because the, the uh, pa past system, the system of the past destroyed diversity, biological diversity and farmers have uh, been impoverished. Uh, the, the, the land too was uh, depleted and the youth uh, fled uh, rural areas. So we, we started to, we initiated a model, a model which was meant to be a reference for young uh, farmers because the land was nearly sterile. We greened them back. That's the first thing we do. We plant trees and we make sure that biodiversity can uh, grow. We create a favorable, a propitious uh, uh, bioclimate, and we create the best conditions for diversified uh, uh, farming. Now, in order to uh, go further, we, we, we went further uh, uh, beyond the demonstration phase. So we decided to work with villages, with local communities, 16 villages, villages uh, were informed 
and uh, they selected youth from each village and each youth would become an ambassador of agroecology for the village where they would have each of these youth would have a one hectare of uh, land the plot would be the property uh, of uh, these youth and they would become ambassadors they would disseminate agroecology at the local level this is what we decided to do with the 16 villages and with the uh, municipalities and so the youth were trained in agroecology went back to their villages with uh, uh, seeds with uh, animals etc and and they uh, implemented what they had learned in their villages on their plots so they are disseminating agroecology across these villages it is a, a a very important topic we need to do that effort and to promote agroecology so that this dimension can be integrated into the uh, farming production system is that okay thank you mr and yeah you still have a few a couple of minutes of course i've seen i've seen the news uh, you know uh, on uh, the french national channels i know that you trained a lot of youth a lot of young people and when they go back to their villages because i think they 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 stay they, they are trained for six to eight months right and when they go back they are totally independent they can produce and market the local fresh products they actually produce they live off the land so they earn a living it's the, their livelihood right yes absolutely you're right yes the, we don't have any difficulty when it comes to marketing the, the products at the local level because we have a we have our own we have customers we are that there are all it's a, it's also a tourist tourism area there are a lot of hotels where uh, patrons want to eat uh, organic food so uh, there's no no problem when it comes to selling the, the products uh, the demand is high because people are becoming more and more aware of the importance of uh, buying and consuming organic food organic products so it's best to avoid uh, consuming products that have been produced in a non-organic uh, uh, way with uh, toxic uh, uh, substances or fertilizers so we, but that's what we do really and uh, we have also young people who actually uh, work also to produce and grow fruits i think you said that you uh, actually took an initiative in the area of uh, uh, ecological tourism so it's possible to go to go to your farm and spend a few days there to be to take an interest in, in how you work and you said that you had a lot of local visitors from people from senegal senegalese people not just uh, not just uh, foreigners also visitors from senegal that, yes yes quite quite we 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 did uh, uh, develop that uh, dimension of environmental tourism and and we did that in partnership with uh, with different regional councils so we managed to uh, put that together and to to organize uh, this uh, in different farms in the area this also helps us market our products because these visitors actually buy and consume uh, the local products. And besides universities uh, are also uh, promoting environmental tourism and they, they send us uh, uh, trainees and schools do the same too, they, they visit us. Uh, so this uh, farm has become a teaching uh, aid as it were for teachers and as for the youth, when they are trained and when they have their own farms, they also develop this uh, environmental tourism dimension, which means that they have to work on biodiversity and living conditions. And it's quite interesting because it's a positive contribution. As for uh, the issue of land, this uh, way of uh, using land has been uh, taken over by other other municipalities it's important this issue of land land ownership especially when it comes to young people so we work with uh, village leaders with uh, uh, schools uh, with with the parents with the, and this means that families 
can uh, grant a plot of land to their children and the municipality is there to validate that agreement so there is no problem the the the, the they have the, the young people have their own fam their own property their own land it's been uh, transferred to them by their families so they become owners of the land but uh, then they have to um, uh, disseminate uh, agroecology we still have two minutes I, I, there is a question of course i invite everyone to see these uh, video clips there was a question with uh, you know a picture of uh, of your of your tr of your trainees or of your pupils only boys right if no girls mm -hmm. so why well actually we had one girl she was trained and she has a plot of land in Babuka. She was trained in 2016, but this year, this year we have more more girls than boys. So this year we have seven girls, two uh, trainees from universities, and five girls who are registered. And this year we we saw many girls regist register. So they are going to work in the production of seeds and vegetables. The, the difficulty was, you know, there was a, it was a problem of resources, in particular accommodation. We lacked accommodation initially. Now we see that girls take an interest in the school farm. I have an, a, a lot of requests. And this year we registered many girls. So we have a lot of girls now in this farm school. And they brought a specific dimension. They, it meant a lot of change for our organization, for the way we do things. Okay, there are many questions. We'll get back to that uh, at a later stage. If you, you know, just uh, see these, uh, watch these video clips. Uh, the question was, for example, how can you get training or access to training in that farm school, Kaidara farm school, and many other questions we'll talk. There was a question about the length of training. You said it, eight to nine months. It was quite interesting, I must say. Besides, you talked about or, or the reforestation because uh, it's a desert area, in your, the, the area where you work, you know, uh, producing in an organic fashion and making sure that uh, the youth retain or remain rather in the, in the area to uh, produce uh, organic products and also green back an area which was uh, uh, which had been deserted so many 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 questions uh, we'll we'll have a look at them at a later stage thank you very much merci beaucoup pour l'intérêt que vous dans le chat je vois un petit peu toutes les questions qui apparaissent without further ado uh, i would like to give the floor to Noé. The co-founder and CTO of Lono in Côte d'Ivoire. Um, actually, um, it will bring another dimension as well to the debate we have now. It was just a snapshot of different initiatives. There are so many that we try to document, but each one, you know, building a little bit uh, uh, towards that agroecological uh, transition. Uh, Noel is um, a bioprocess engineer with experience in energy and uh, nutrient recovery from organic waste. He founded with um, Louise Bailverde Lono, uh, based, uh, in, uh, Côte Divoire, based in Côte d'Ivoire, that makes carbon and nutrient recycling accessible to farmers. So he launched in 2017 um, two products uh, with the brand Kubeco uh, that can really uh, bring smallholder farmers with recycled nutrients and organic matter back from, uh, you know, uh, waste into their soils. Uh, you work directly with the cooperatives and large evaluation organizations and you are working on uh, sustainability as well with EcoCert and others. You have been, like many of the previous uh, speakers, um, received uh, um, innovation prizes. Uh, the latest I saw was the Royal Academy of Engineering as well as uh, uh, Pre -African, African Prize of Innovation. So thank you very much for sharing that very important uh, experience of, you know, um, addressing the food waste which is, is massive in our, in our 
sector, but also, you know, developing byproducts which can be used again into, uh, into the agriculture and the agri-food sector. So, Noel, you choose uh, actually uh, the language as you are bilingual and uh, tell me if you share yourself the screen, actually, uh, or you want, well, we do that for you. Okay, I'll share it myself. Then Thank I need you. One second. In maximum 10 minutes. Um, Sorry, I was expect. Um, actually, can you then yes, do that? Because I wasn't can, expecting it. Yeah, yes, sorry. Yes, we can do that. Yeah. Right. So, um, hi everyone. I'm um, as as Isolina introduced. I'm Noel Nguessan from Côte d'Ivoire, um, and the company is called Lono. And we really try to make accessible the the bio waste processing to the different scales because um, it's been discussed here extensively. The smallholder farmers. Um, but there's also cooperatives that, you know, aggregate thousands of farmers. There's factories that process the produce of the farmers. So there's, there's different volumes of um, bio waste available and um, also different seasonalities. So what, what we try to do with the product Cubeco, especially, is to make that really accessible to the smallest scale. And, uh, and maybe if we go to the next slide. We have three ways of doing this. We have the product Cubeco. So the, the Cubeco, there's, there's, two, there's two products, the composter and the biodigester that are really patented turnkey solutions, you know, plug and play for the farmer. The second one is um, looking at different business models and setting up agri agricultural trials because in the, or even animal feed trials, because when the bio waste is um, processed, either fertilizer, animal feed, or even energy, you need a trial phase, you know, to, to really scale it. So, so, and the business model must be adapted a bit to the context. That context, even in a country like Cote d'Ivoire, which is not so big, can really, um, I'm, say, I'm, I'm reading in the chat that they can't hear. Is it, uh... I can hear you very well. Okay, well then I will So we will, we will reply, yes, bilaterally, um, yeah. So then, um, yeah, so the, 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 you need to set up some trials to make sure the, the, yeah, the, the yields are correct, the, the value, you know, to kind of confirm the value of the product you're making and the cost of production. So that's a little bit on uh, the second thing we do. And usually we, we link that to the third thing, which is setting up industrial projects because uh, yes, there's a smallholder farmers that can use Kibeko, but there's waste feedstocks that are centralized somewhat at factory level. So, so we do work with them. So we do work with them uh, to set up industrial projects. So next slide. So to, to explain a little bit the intervention here, we see a photo at the Coco Cooperative that is trialing the Cubeco to compost the waste from the post-harvest waste. Um, in the case of Coco, there's the pods, but typically a Coco farmer does do a lot of other things. So, so we work with them. Um, we work with them to to not only use the cocoa waste, but other ways that they have available to make good quality compost. With uh, fifty units installed, and the payback period currently lies around two years. Um, these trials and um, actual commercial orders are mainly in palm, cocoa, fruit, and then we get in the in the fruit specifically, it's mango and citrus. So, so that's that's the one intervention, and then there's the biodigester as well, which, um, well, I mean, we 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 know we know. I think this audience is uh, well versed in these types of things. So then there's a biogas that's produced that they can use for cooking, and then because of the digestion, you also get a compost, but in the liquid form. So, so as you see, both the Cubeco's compost and biodigester are really about um, about making fertilizer. Even the biodigester, we get the gas for cooking, yes, but the economic value, the payback period, all of that is based on the, on the liquid compost product. So the next slide, we can look at the trials because the, yes, compost is good for the soil. There's, there's a little debate on that. However, if you want to make it some economic input and a substitute for chemical fertilizer, you do need to get a bit more precise so, so we set up some demonstration plants with our farmers, training, 
Um, also try to measure the, the CO2 reduction footprint um, of this compost as opposed to either doing nothing or applying chemical fertilizers. Um, so that's, that's one core activity because for us, it, it's relevant to the customers, of course, but it's also relevant to us to, to refine our business models, particularly for industrial projects and develop a market for these uh, new types of, let's say, fertilizers, like circular economy fertilizers. So in the next slide, um, we look at the industrial project. So mainly we are focused on larger compostations, but with an approach of setting up a bioeconomy in the regions where these, um, where these factories will be set up. Because once they exist, they become um, um, draws for bio waste. Um, depending on the composition of the bio waste, the distance and so on, it can be a value and um, progressively you, you create a, a market, you know, a market for the waste. And, uh, uh, and th that's a big thing that's missing beyond the regulatory barriers huh, that, that are still a little bit, um, not, you know, let's say reg the, the reg regulatory framework is still quite bare here. However, just the, the value perception of the waste is, uh, is something that needs to be market driven. And that's what these hubs do on top of just producing the biofertilizer. So the first factories, as, uh, when we get to case studies, we'll discuss it a bit more, but we got the first factory financed that will produce uh, 5,000 tons of um, compost and 5,000 tons of liquid biofertilizer. And the potential we see is for four of these factories in the next six years with uh, 25,000 tons CO2 sequestered just through the compost use and 8,000 hectares can be impacted in, in terms of fertilization. So if we look at a bit more concretely, what does a Cubeco use um, look like, you know? We can look at the, the mangoes, the case of the mango farmers, where they use the premium that they, they, they obtained from their certification programs to finance 15 units in the first year. And the, the idea was, well, it will produce a, a cheap fertilizer. Maybe as a context, mango farmers typically use zero fertilizer. So it's, so it's quite, you know, so yeah. So the yield, the, the quality of the mangoes are amazing, but the yields are not so high. Um, but there's a problem of fruit flies because it's, it's a risk for the entire value chain in Cote d'Ivoire. As we know with the EU regulations, is a, there's a set number of containers that could have fruit fly contaminated mangoes per one country before it's blacklisted. So, so, so it's a national problem. And uh, the idea was this composter would then give a reason for farmers to pick up mangoes that fall to the ground and that become um, nests for the fruit flies to, to, to produce. This, the farmers have been told to pick up these mangoes and get rid of them, but you know, it's a cost, it's time. So they don't do it. Now, when you tell them, pick it up, put it in your composter and get free fertilizer, well, that's a different proposition. So that's a bit what was proposed there. And then we have, um, after two years, 20 installed and the, the, the interest is very high. The quality of the compost has been proven. The, we've seen um, improvements in the quality and quantity of the mangoes produced. Uh, but the cost of the unit is, is still rather high. In, uh, if we're talking euros, we're talking about 900 euros that we're trying to bring down to, to six, 700. But currently the price is high. Two year payback period is a bit long for a smallholder farmer they, to expect one year payback. So on the tech side, we're working to bring it down. So case study two, maybe we can look at um, the biodigester. So for the, that's a Cubeco biodigester here, you see it uh, linked to a storage bag and that is then linked to a burner. So this, this digester is just like any other domestic digester, except that we make it here in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, it's a bit specific to, to the waste we have here. There's, um, there's um, baffles inside it, compartments, so that you can get a bit of a higher yield per volume. And it's more resistant to shocks of changes of, of waste. You know, you can move from one waste to another as the seasons change without, um, without impacting the production too much. So that's a bit of differentiation, the size and the, 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 the flexibility in terms of waste. And we see with cassava processing, you get, you know, Acheke, if you're from West Africa, you must know Acheke. And um, as you make an HK, you get this acid wastewater that is well, stinky, but also bad for the environment. And that wastewater can lead to, to biogas production. Uh, we have 
a couple of units installed, good results, and we're working with our government to try and set up a biodigester program, not just for Lono, for the entire uh, ecosystem here, but this, this Quebeco product could be part of it. And there's potential for 6,000 units in Cote d'Ivoire, just in cassava. So that is, that is very high potential um, socioeconomic because you get the, the fertilizer as well. I mean, this is, uh, this is definitely a win-win-win, you know? Case study three. Yeah, then the industrial case. I mean, like we said, the, the idea definitely is to produce uh, profitably biofertilizers, and then we can have some bioenergy as well for our own needs. However, the, the, the hub factor is, is the most interesting, in our opinion, in terms of scaling, because um, Cote d'Ivoire produces every year 30 million tons of agricultural waste alone every year. Because, you know, number one in cocoa, that cocoa alone is 15 million tons a year. Cashew, we're number one exporter, that's 5 million tons. Just, just those two is 20 million tons of bio waste. That, that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. So, so there's, a, there's a need to, to have a supply chain that can absorb this volume of waste. And that's where the hub approach is, is relevant. Uh, we are starting with one. There's, uh, there's already an actor in Cote d'Ivoire, but we are starting with one with a slightly different model. Um, 10,000 tons per year production, so 5,000 solid, 5,000 liquid. We already have a grant from the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and we plan to begin production uh, in August 2022. We're looking for co-financing for the second half of the of the investment need. So, if anyone in the in the audience is interested, please reach out. Um, and then I think that kind of summarizes what Lono does. Just next slide, in case I'm uh, wrong. Yeah, the team, of course. Sorry. So yeah, and I mean, I'm um, the co-founder, um, and I'm with Luis, other co-founder. So I'm an engineer, she's an international development specialist with um, some experience in, at the EU level in the Netherlands and also in um, entrepreneurship in West Africa, both of us. We have a team of young engineers, chemical and um, agro. And we have some advisors, uh, one specifically in entrepreneurship because uh, yeah, we, we did make some mistakes early on being too technical or, or too vision oriented. Entrepreneurship is a, is a, is a job. And then uh, we have the scientific advisor as well, Prof Dongo, who's, a, who's a very well known in the field of bio waste in Cote d'Ivoire. So that's uh, the core team. We have five other members of the team, a total of 11 people, but this is the main, the main core of the team. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Noel, uh, from Cote d'Ivoire. Thank you very much for sharing these, not only your efforts in reducing waste and supporting the small holders, but also uh, to, um, you know, uh, make them in fertilizers as the normally the law, it's a very low adoption in Cote d'Ivoire uh, of that. So uh, it will improve significantly, uh, not only the, the production, but uh, the quality as well. So we'll get back to you. You have raised a lot, of, a lot of interest as well. I invite you to look at the chat and the question because the questions are a bit in, in both um, to answer some uh, directly. And uh, without a major uh, delay now, we go to the session, uh, which is um, with uh, our discussants, our experts uh, from policy, research, finance, you know, which ov obviously are working on agroecology or supporting that uh, agroecological transition. Uh, and we start uh, by uh, Emile Frison. Emile Frison is the member of the International pa Panel of Experts on Sustainable Food Systems, IPES, IPES Food. Um, he has worked, uh, you might know him in his very uh, uh, previous capacities uh, uh, before as a Director General of Biodiversity International. He has worked in many African countries, Nigeria, Mauritania, uh, very much interested on the nutritional quality of diets, the sustainability, resilience, and productivity of smallholder agriculture. Um, he has published a very, of course, a lot, uh, but uh, one of the latest, very, very interesting and very uh, um, uh, interesting for, the, for our conversation today uh, is the report from uniformity to diversity, a paradigm shift from industrial agriculture to diversified agroecological systems. He's the um, vice chair of the board of directors of uh, Eco Agriculture Partners and a member of the mission board on soil health and food of the European Commission. So uh, Emil, uh, good to see you. And uh, from, um, of course, you work on IPIS food, on agroecology, looking at many other cases, not only in Africa or Europe, but even beyond, but that could give insights on the discussion of today and especially out 
to scale up as well agroecology. What are your insights also after listening to uh, our um, uh, entrepreneurs today? Thank you very much. Thank you, Iselina. It's a pleasure to uh, join uh, this uh, webinar here or this meeting. Um, it is very encouraging to hear the many examples we uh, heard today where uh, we see a practical application of a transformation of towards greater sustainability and, and equity. This is really uh, an important uh, encouragement for the urgent uh, real food system transformation that is required. As you mentioned <clears throat> uh, at the beginning, the uh, food system summit uh, that was held on the 23rd of September highlighted the importance of really addressing our food systems um, that are currently not sustainable. I think there was really uh, uni universal recognition that we must have a strong and deep transformation of our food systems if we want to be able to reach the sustainable development goals by 2030. We have only nine harvests left uh, before 2030. And I think there was a wake up call in this uh, food system summit uh, on the realization that we really must be uh, serious about addressing uh, this issue of uh, unsustainable food systems. Until recently, until now, I would, would say, uh, agroecology has still been a very much a minority uh, um, part of, of uh, agricultural production and, and our food systems. And that must really change. And there has been really a wake up call uh, also in the context of uh, the food system summit where a large number of propositions were made for game-changing solutions uh, around agroecology. And uh, <clears throat> in the Food System Summit, this was uh, put together in a cluster on uh, agroecology with more than 80 different uh, proposals. It was actually, actually the solution cluster that counted the largest number of proposals uh, trans, uh, translating uh, by that the great interest there was and the recognition that this is uh, an important approach for the, the future. Uh, already at the pre-summit, uh, we organized a session on agroecology that brought together 1,361 participants. This was one of the best attended sessions uh, of the pre-summit. Uh, on agroecology, where we had five ministers speaking about the importance of a real deep transformation based on, on agroecology and the 13 principles of agroecology. What is really important is that we realize th this, this need for uh, uh, a deep uh, transformation, just trying to make our current uh, unsustainable systems more efficient to address uh, the, the climate challenge uh, or the nutrition challenge is not going to uh, be sufficient. And that also has been very widely recognized. We must really have a paradigm shift away from a model that was um, productivist, focusing essentially on productivity increases at the expense of all the other dimensions, whether it's nutrition, whether it's the environment, uh, pollution, climate uh, impact, uh, or the social impact. Uh, we heard already uh, about the fact that, that farmers are often uh, not receiving, in, in the opening statement, uh, the farmers are not receiving a, a decent uh, and equitable uh, income. And that really requires that we embrace these 13 principles as a whole set uh, just trying to improve also some individual practices will not be sufficient. We must really rethink our food systems based on these 13 principles. And that's the goal of a coalition on agroecology that has emerged out of this food system uh, summit process. And I had the uh, privilege of co-leading 
the development of that uh, coalition together with Esther Penunia from the Asian Farmer Association and uh, Fergus Sinclair, uh, who was the lead author of the uh, report on agroecological and other innovative approaches uh, of the high level panel of experts of the food, um, uh, food security um, uh, it, uh, uh, commission. So we uh, aim at uh, bringing together a large number of countries and organizations to really foster a mainstreaming of agroecology and uh, implementing this uh, transformation. As of today, we already have 24 countries that have joined this coalition. Uh, and also 32 organizations. Among the countries, we have 11 African countries. So almost half of the countries that have joined are from Africa. And I think that that is uh, an important recognition of the, the role that agroecology can play, particularly in uh, Africa. And among the uh, major organizations, uh, we have uh, IFAD, we have uh, UNDP, we have UNEP, we have the World Food Programme, uh, several research organizations, farmer organizations like ROPA in West Africa uh, or AFA in, in Asia, also national agriculture, uh, national farmer organizations. And I think this uh, really puts us uh, in an opportunity to really boost the transformation uh, of our food systems. So far, investments in agroecology have been very limited. Uh, it's estimated uh, maybe around 5% of total investments, whether it's in research or in, in development projects. That has to shift now to 95%. Uh, and it's not just increasing a little bit. We must really have a wholesale transformation. So I think that uh, this will require supportive policies redirecting uh, perverse incentives and subsidies, uh, such as fertilizer subsidies, for example, or input subsidies towards subsidies that support the transformation. And I think it's very encouraging to see that small enterprises uh, can really play a key role in uh, being very active partners in this transformation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emile, uh, uh, for uh, your remarks. Um, we are a bit uh, pressed by time, but without uh, more delay, uh, Christophe Larose, I think many uh, of us and many of the audience today is looking at you from the European Commission, uh, not only uh, because the European Commission is leading uh, the, the green, I mean, uh, globally, not only in the EU, mm -hmm. but also with the developing uh, partners, developing country partners, and at the global level, uh, uh, the green agenda, uh, the farm to fork, green deal, um, major initiatives supporting directly research uh, uh, and, and practicalities uh, for the agroecological transformation like the Desira initiative and many others. So uh, certainly as a technical partner, as a supporter of research, policy perspective, as well as, of course, a finance as well. It's uh, the major uh, uh, partner for most of our farmers, entrepreneurs, and other interested uh, people. Uh, Christophe, you um, uh, work for the European Commission. Uh, you have been many, many years in many uh, EU delegations in Mauritius, covering the whole Indian Ocean uh, part in South Africa, etc. Uh, you are now in Brussels. You are heading the sector in charge of sustainable agriculture, which includes innovation, research, and digitalization in agriculture. So really, we welcome very much uh, a, a bit new insights and from a perspective to the entrepreneurs and support to farmers and entrepreneurs as well, uh, some of you, uh, of you um, uh, thinking about that. Thank you. Merci, uh, Isolina. Donc, je vais, je vais uh, m'adresser en français. Et, uh... Thank you, Isolina. I'll uh, speak French. I would first like uh, to thank you uh, all for this initiative and uh, congratulate uh, the different uh, uh, panel members for their presentation and for the quality of their projects. I was uh, very interested in uh, 
Uh, the starting point that have uh, to be mentioned, uh, amongst which uh, a focus on family farming, a small uh, whole uh, agriculture, and the role of small farmers uh, in uh, uh, their respective uh, countries all over the world and uh, amongst others in Africa or other uh, continents. I'd also like to come back on the agricultural value, be it in terms of a new value creation and the distribution of a value, a fair distribution of value. Furthermore, uh, um, we have indications that uh, uh, the challenges uh, uh, I've already been documented, unsustainable uh, agricultural practices, uh, uh, the uh, problems of uh, uh, frailty, of uh, poverty, climate change, uh, uh, which is also a factor that is uh, very visible. Uh, we also uh, witnessed the deterioration of soil, of uh, land, and uh, the depletion of resources. Um, and when listening to the different presentations, I wondered uh, how different initiatives resting on agroecological transition principles then resting on the implementation of uh, those principles. Uh, I was wondering how this uh, agroecology vision helps us uh, uh, take, uh, take up uh, those challenges uh, in uh, the most integrated way as uh, possible and being aware of the need to uh, foster economic sustainability. We know that the uh, uh, agricultural sector is a very fragile sector of activity. People uh, are entitled to uh, better living standards. Uh, they should also enjoy uh, social and environmental sustainability. And it is uh, interesting to uh, uh, touch upon agroecology in a session dedicated to innovation, uh, because uh, we see through the projects that have been introduced uh, that uh, progress rests on innovation. Uh, innovation requires knowledge, uh, uh, traditional knowledge, of course, uh, but that uh, uh, traditional knowledge should not uh, uh, be left on its own. It should also um, take advantage of partnerships and research. We should uh, open up to uh, the uh, question of uh, technologies, new technologies, infrastructure, equipment or material, because these elements are part and parcels of the agroecological transition agenda. And I'd like to add something that might have been uh, uh, forgotten uh, for a while or has been cast aside uh, uh, because of a limited uh, agroecological agenda, which is uh, the access to markets. Agroecological uh, produce uh, need uh, buyers, need markets, and need to be sold at a decent price. Consequently, the vision we have of uh, innovation is one in which we should pay as much uh, attention to supply than uh, to demand. And we have to have a systemic uh, vision if you want to foster these agroecological transition projects. And to stick to the time that I was given, I would like to uh, simply say a few words about how in our external activities, we within the European Union um, support and accompany these uh, 
uh, movements that are local movements uh, uh, limited to the countries themselves. How do we foster agroecological transition in these countries? We do so uh, from a different basis. Uh, first of all, research and the role of research in uh, the transition, uh, the research uh, work carried out at national level, uh, at the role of European research and international research works, so because uh, at uh, EU level, we have uh, just um, uh, publicized Nigeria's uh, financing means uh, that uh, uh, grant priority to uh, the agroecological dimension of uh, agribusiness and agricultural production. We are having these debates uh, and uh, we want to promote them uh, together with our partners at a European level amongst others. A partnership that gives us the possibility to intervene in uh, countries, be they in Africa or elsewhere. And uh, these projects are based on uh, a very clear agroecological agenda. Um, be it at the level of uh, the French, uh, German, or Belgian uh, uh, cooperation services, we have uh, fostered and encouraged partnerships in the field. And we also li uh, like to assist operators, facilitators, and I'm very happy uh, to see the commitment uh, uh, made by Coliacipe uh, at that level, because uh, we have uh, to uh, think about uh, what it means to facilitate uh, trade in products derived from organic production, certified organic production. Uh, we have uh, tools, uh, there are means, uh, and there is a demand, a demand in uh, um, partner countries and amongst uh, European consumers, uh, but uh, not only in Africa, uh, in Europe, sorry, as we've seen, uh, African consumers are also uh, buying those products and demand is there and should be strengthened. And if you allow me, I'd like to uh, conclude on a reference uh, to a facility that is being developed with agri agencies at European level and farmer organizations on the role of uh, farming associations, producer organizations uh, in the uh, research and innovation in the field of agroecology. And we have uh, uh, initiated uh, a program uh, aiming at assisting a series of farming uh, farmers organization that will uh, carry out uh, operational research work, um, work that uh, should uh, uh, meet the needs uh, on the ground, uh, research carried out by uh, farmers and would like to uh, uh, go on uh, partnering with uh, farmer organizations, support services uh, and research because uh, we think it is absolutely essential if we want to uh, insufflate change in uh, practices. And it is also an advocacy work that has to be carried out by farmer organizations at a local, national or a continental uh, levels. And as a conclusion, I'd like to uh, thank you for this initiative, uh, an initiative that shows uh, that shows us that uh, uh, things are happening on the ground in the different countries. Uh, and it is not only the result of a European uh, uh, policy encouraging countries to adopt a much more sustainable vision of uh, uh, farming. Those are endogenous uh, processes uh, uh, launched by the countries themselves, uh, the countries that are well aware of the need to evolve, to change practices, uh, and to um, go towards what I would call agroecological intensification, if uh, I can use that term. And I'll uh, uh, stop here. I would like to thank you uh, very much again, and I'm very uh, uh, looking forward to uh, the rest of the discussion. 
Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we can only agree with uh, you and your European Union colleagues. Uh, uh, it's indeed that those practice that, that what has been done is the result of practices adopted by uh, small farmers, SMEs, uh, small structures. Uh, and um, our innovation session uh, are dedicated to technological innovation, but all other elements, all other factors of uh, agroecology now, how um, local competences and skills. I, I want also to say there are many requests for contacts uh, in the chat and uh, so we will be follow up one by one, Axel does that systematically because we cannot share a list of participants with contacts for just the law on, on, on the protection of data, that's the only uh, part, but we follow bilaterally and link you always to the people you want to be linked with their agreement. So without major delay and asking Charles, please, for your help uh, in, in doing a, a very short, um, uh, you know, uh, commentary on what you have heard, uh, you are working for AFSA, AFSA on advocacy and campaign. I mean, uh, um, Christophe was just mentioning the need as well to, to do advocacy, meaning to inform much more the people of uh, those, uh, those possibilities on being uh, uh, more uh, sustainable and supporting sustainable practices. Uh, so it's the Alliance for Food Sovereignty in Africa, uh, who works a lot actually promoting for many, many years uh, agroecology. Uh, an interesting development as well is that you um, uh, have documented some of the cases that I've read uh, with great interest uh, on agroecological principles and practices in Africa. Uh, and um, you are also going towards more uh, entrepreneurship development and trying to what we all try to do, uh, even if it's difficult sometimes to upscale some of those uh, uh, to a significant you know, level, some of those uh, practices. So please, in five minutes. Thank you, Charles. Thank you. Thank you so much, Isolina, and the team for organizing this great workshop. And also I need to acknowledge the powerful and insightful presentation from my fellow panelists and also the, the previous speakers that made very powerful and easy entry to my submission. My name is Charles Oluang Mulozi. I work with the Alliance for Sovereignty in Africa based in Kampala office. Um, I'm going to respond to the submission based on the, the one year, from the experience from the one year research that we undertook in collaboration with agroecological, uh, agroecological fund. Very interesting research. An alliance for sovereignty, we work in around 50 African countries with more than 47, um, 47 members. Um, one of the key things from the submission we've had, the most important thing that comes through that um, the African agroecological entrepreneurs, amid the constraints, they are doing enormous work in transforming the socioeconomic uh, structures of their community through the school feeding programs, uh, providing avenue for learning and association, as well as the learning for improvement for smallholder farmers. Um, when we conducted the research in collaboration with Agroecological Fund, we were able to make a number of pointers in terms of what we need to do, but also some resonate with the, with the sharing from my colleagues. And one of the things that we found very interesting in terms of this conversation is the question of access to financing. The question of access to financing has become very difficult. That some of these entrepreneurs, they engage in a number of very uh, and diverse uh, enterprises, right from the growers, cooperatives, aggregators, urban backyard farming, cooperatives and NGOs. And they engage in varied activities ranging from productions, processing, farm input, farm infrastructure, forging, cooking, and a number of stuff. But two constraints that we found, for example, one, they have a number of experience in the farming. And when my colleagues talk about um, mutual partnership, it's a big entry point that they have enormous experience. So are we going to use that experience to transform them instead of changing what they have or in introducing alternatives. Another interesting thing in terms of investment that majority of these smallholder farmers access less than 49,000 US dollars to support them transition, around 59, almost about 60% of this, or they struggle to access finance. Still on finance, in terms of um, access to finance, we realize that almost 
70 80% they get money from their own personal savings around 38 gets financing from grants and 21 from bank loans with a number of constraints in terms of collateral securities in terms of there are so many barriers that affect their transition but also their innovations in in farming as you could see from a number of cases that my colleagues were able to to, to share markets remain a big big constraints big big constraints and one of the conversation that has been started is a conversation about the territorial market UN FAO, African Union, a number of civil society organizations that if you have to deal with the constraints and be in positions to, to realize the dreams and the desire we have for African smallholder farmers and entrepreneurs, we need to create avenues for short chains and also knowledge within the short chain markets and also be in positions to strengthen that. With COVID has made it very profound that some of these markets, they are resilient, the informal market are very much resilient and therefore how do we make them more accessible, more productive, and above all, the, 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 the cost of transition we want to see in the smallholder farmers? The question about um, um, women and youth are very central in these conversations. Most of you are uh, aware from the case study shared that Africa has very young populations, very young population, and so women are strongly involved in these. And, um, enterprises. So for us to make any transformation, so their voice must be very central as you've seen in number of case studies. So how do we make sure that their voices make cause the change you want to see in the transition to agroecology and also food sovereignty in Africa? They have a lot to gain from this process. At the same time, they have a lot to contribute to this process of transformation into agroecological um, process. The key last findings that we're able to pick that also strongly resonate from the submission from my colleagues and the, 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 the previous speakers and the presenters that there is actual problem of enabling legal and institutional frameworks to make sure that support these people um, realize their dreams, their desire, but also cause the change they want to see in their communities. Starting from budget allocation for most of the African government in agriculture, and transition in agricultural process quite minimum. Some countries give like less as 2%, no form of subsidies, no any form of grants, no any form of support. Even the little support that they give through microfinance to get through the commercial banks with almost 30% interest rate, that make it extremely difficult for the African agricultural entrepreneurs being pushed to, to reach out to the kind of the transition they want to see. So in conclusion, we came up with some summary in terms of what African governments, development partners, and some of these diplomatic missions need to put in place. One is reliable markets. How do we promote procurement programs to stimulate local markets helped by diversity and entrepreneurship in Africa? It's a big question that we need to have a very honest conversation at. Then the question of loans, access to loans. It is clear that most African countries, access to loans are around, the loan interest are around more than 25 to 30. And it's become very difficult for smallholder entrepreneurs with limited collateral security to access this loan. And then the question of good input, quality, diversity, and production. Then the mutual aid and support, good network, enabling legal and institutional framework, right up from infrastructure, certification, and all these process. We need to put them in place. But most importantly, African agricultural entrepreneurs, they need trust. They need to be trusted. They need to be supported based on what they have then they gradually grow and make the contribution they want to see to the world. So I've rushed the process, but in this research, we're able to reach more than 180 small agricultural entrepreneurs in 20 African countries who reach out to a number of service providers that they acknowledge the crisis the smallholder farmers are facing and entrepreneurs are facing in Africa, but they have limited our platform for mutual conversation, as my colleague has put, so that they mutually grow and make the transition they want to see. I'm going to put the link for this research where you can receive, you can be in position to read by yourself around seven case studies we document in this process, report from two regions, East Africa and West Africa, two countries, and also a number of policy briefs and policy studies that were able to come through. So I'm going to post right now to the link and you can be in position to read because of time. Thank you so much, uh, Isolina.
Thank you very much, Charles, for this uh, very uh, absolutely correct fact that is underfunded, that youth and women, and many youth, we are very pleased to see that are in agroecology uh, as well and trying their best to make our future much more sustainable. Uh, we are, of course, as always, taken by time, but it's always, we said, is a, is a start of a conversation, not, not the end. Uh, and I've seen uh, very, very active already responses and, uh, uh, and contribution to the chat. So please, uh, Fat Ma, um, you have uh, some uh, uh, summary of some of the insights in the chat or some of your own before we give the floor to the speakers and then to um, President of PAFO and Jeremy. Yes, thank you, uh, Isolina. It was very dynamic, as uh, you said. Uh, there are interactions. Thank you. Thanks for the panelists who, uh, who are answering uh, the questions. Uh, there are uh, several interactions, so I'm not going to come back to these uh, questions. But uh, of course, uh, many times the, the issue of financement of funding uh, came several times. So, and um, for some informations who are uh, lacking some uh, informations, please, you can go through the concept note of this session. Uh, and please, you can read all the details, the links, for the websites, so you can have a, a little bit more information. Of course, also, one of the purpose and the objectives of PAFO to partner with Colea CP for these innovation sessions, it's to uh, share knowledge. And uh, this is how we can enhance and know what, uh, what is already implemented, how we can uh, upscale what is implemented and how we can replicate. So, uh, as said, Isolina, this is the beginning. It's not the end of our discussions. Uh, also, one of the questions, so it's really um, a general question uh, asked by Edwin. What actions are, uh, are being taken to promote consumption of organic foods uh, in our county? So it's uh, going to uh, guarantee more adoption of su sustainable ecological agriculture. Um, Pour Gustave, la question qui s'est posée, est-ce qu'il y a un uh, marché? Gustave, uh, there was a question about the existence of a local organic produce market in Togo. Uh, and I'm talking about a local market, but we could uh, go beyond the national borders and consider the uh, regional or continental organic produce market. Uh, do they exist? That was the first question. Second question, how could you overcome the problems of uh, lockdown and uh, COVID-19? How could you... Uh, uh, overcome the problems. Um, especially, um, what is the, the um, production uh, life uh, regarding your uh, production? And for both of you, Gustav and uh, Yemi, uh, how are organized your relationship with the producers? So who decide about the price? Do you have uh, production contracts, etc. And, and do you have exclusivity with producers under these contracts? Uh, Monsieur Ndiaye, uh, tout à l'heure, Isolina a posé la question concernant... Mr. Ndiaye, Isolina asked the question about the role of women or the place of women in your models and uh, more specifically how you fund or how this experience can be duplicated. Um, uh, the question was also asked, uh, do you know whether you um, enjoy um, agroclimatic services enabling you to um, encourage upscale your experience? Uh, of course, for, uh, for more details, for more information, as I told you, you, you are invited to go to the links in the concept note and you will be uh, more informed. As said, Isolina, unfortunately, we are not allowed to share the data of our uh, participants. Uh, of course, later you will have um, the, the sheets, uh, so the, uh, these templates of presentation of all these experiences, and you can see their details. You will have more uh, opportunity to contact them and to connect with them. Uh, over to you, Isolina. 
you, thank you very much, Fatma. Donc très très rapidement, uh, Monsieur Gustave, on well, va reprendre. Very quickly, uh, Mr. Gustave, we're going to uh, go through the same uh, order of presentation. Uh, a question was uh, raised as to the problem of local markets, uh, because you told us that your model is a very sustainable one. But uh, the question is, can it be um, upscaled uh, to local markets? And um, um, also the effect of uh, the pandemic. I think you've overcome those problems, but uh, you've got the floor. Uh, your microphone is muted. Uh, could you please switch on your microphone? Thank you very much for these questions. Uh, I've tried to answer as many questions as possible uh, through the uh, chat. Concerning your first uh, question, I would say that uh, organic uh, a farming market is an expanding market currently in Africa. And I think that this holds true for demand in uh, organic products throughout the world. Africa is no exception to that rule. It is an expanding market. This being said, uh, we know that uh, organic uh, uh, produce go with uh, an additional cost. And uh, we have to acknowledge the fact that uh, the uh, living standards uh, of uh, African people uh, is uh, a problem. Because even though I feel like eating organic products, I might not be able to afford them. Nevertheless, we have um, uh, uh, social middle class that uh, is emerging and that is very interested in consuming uh, organic products. Um, but the second question is, what is uh, the organic product of supply that is uh, uh, put at the disposal of Africa? Because uh, the organic products supplied uh, uh, to the uh, European uh, markets might be different from those uh, that are sold on African uh, markets. I export uh, pineapple, for, for example. It's an exotic product uh, that can't be uh, uh, produced in uh, Europe, uh, and, which means that uh, uh, the, the demand is there. And I have to use the uh, opportunities that are offered to me. Of course, these products are are exported to, to uh, Europe. And people here do not understand uh, the difference in prices because they know that the, the same product can be uh, bought at a much lower price on the local market. So we have to adapt a local uh, uh, supply to local demand. And this depends, of course, on the organic product value chains. Uh, we have to uh, solve that problem through a modification of value chains, I would say. Concerning your second question, what we were all strongly affected by COVID-19. We were asked what provisions we made uh, in the presence of that pandemic. Of course, we started to wash hands with soap. We started wearing masks. Uh, uh, we um, uh, started using hydroalcoholic gel. But the question is uh, elsewhere. I think that uh, it refers to the way we organized our activity to overcome the problems and obstacles. Uh, well, well uh, but some consequences were unavoidable because uh, people, uh, there was a lockdown, so there was no plane travel, uh, no planes are going or coming. And even though there is a demand, uh, you cannot uh, load uh, the the, uh, the aircraft and uh, carry your uh, uh, produce elsewhere. So uh, th there was a problem, but the large amount of fruit that uh, uh, could not be exported were re-channeled towards local markets and that managed us to compensate for the loss. Now, financially speaking, obviously, uh, we experienced uh, a financial impact and uh, the uh, uh, demand was also uh, impacted by COVID-19. We adopted, uh, adapted our plans 
to try and uh, prevent uh, the worst possible situation and adapt our activities. What is done is beyond us, but uh, we made major decisions to try and get prepared uh, for further problems. Um, thank you very much, uh, Gustave. And uh, uh, you talked about uh, local organic uh, produce uh, that require information, awareness raising in Europe. It, it wasn't an easy uh, uh, an easy journey. It took a while. Uh, we have to raise awareness uh, about uh, sustainable practices, about the, the question of price. Hola, uh, Yemi. Um, to local, uh, local food and local um, products and local Thank you so here. much. Very, very shortly, um, yes. I, there were several questions there, so I'll um, start one by one. Very shortly. Um, the first question, um, can everyone hear me? Yes, very shortly, please. Okay, I can't hear anyone back, but I'm going to assume everyone can hear me. Um, the first question was regarding shelf life. Um, shelf life of the fruit prior to processing, um, it rots in season, but once processed, it's um, pretty much um, frozen, and the frozen fruit lasts for about two years. So last season, we became um, really the largest purchaser of the fruit in the country with uh, purchasing about seven tons. Um, for our own products that we make um, using it, the sauces last about two years. They have a shelf life of about two years. And the jams, uh, reduced sugar, have a shelf life of about 16 months. Um, regarding exclusivity, uh, no, we do not have exclusive contracts with um, either the harvesters or with the um, cosmetic oil processors. Um, personally, I don't and we don't think that this is the best way for them to grow or the communities to grow and benefit. And so we'd like to see everyone grow, especially because this is um, these are fruits that are being reintegrated back into the food system, orphan crops. Um, although we are currently the largest in our country, um, we think that there is plenty of space to grow in this empty space on the table. So we don't have any exclusivity in terms of the contracts, but we do have agreements, yes. In terms of production contracts, we do have agreements. Uh, when it comes to price, um, prices, I'm very happy to say, have increased over the years. When we started, uh, the price of a, um, uh, a packet or of um, 5 kg Morula pulp was at around five pula per kg. Um, this has now actually since gone up over time to about 10 pula per kg, but I believe is actually still very competitive when it comes to other uh, frozen fruit pulps that are around that price. Um, in other countries, for example, uh, Namibia, for example, um, it's at around two pula. Um, but at that 10 pula I talked about locally, that's about um, under one US dollar per kg. So I hope I answered all of the questions there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Monsieur uh, Ndiaye, vous nous avez déjà parlé. Uh... Mr. Ndiaye, you talked about uh, the participation, uh, a higher participation of uh, uh, girls in your products. Uh, many countries uh, uh, have uh, uh, asked whether they could uh, go and visit your uh, a school farm. Uh, well, they, many have asked whether it is a replicable uh, um, model. And uh, what do you miss after such a long experience in two minutes? In terms of training, FAO uh, contributed to the funding of two generations of young uh, trainees, uh, co-funded alongside uh, local uh, authorities. Uh, we've managed to uh, train uh, rural communities that have committed themselves to um, a put um, a plot of land at the disposal of young people. That's one of the conditions. Uh, once a young uh, person has completed their training in our school, they go back to their village and are given a, a plot of land. And that enables uh, them to start working. And therefore, we need local uh, authorities to foster the access to land for these young people. 
at the national level, we see a greater interest from uh, state authorities, and we've got uh, an institution or an, or an organization called Agripreneurs uh, who have uh, uh, signed a partnership agreement with the state uh, to enable young people to get uh, trained uh, within our school. We haven't signed a covenant as yet, but we are currently discussing the way we can develop our activity and replicate it at national level. And we uh, have other organizations uh, as, uh, supporting us. Uh, the uh, Ami d'Afrique, for instance, have uh, covered the fees uh, for three uh, girls who came to our school. And um, uh, another three girls have been funded by their own parents. Um, thank you very much. Uh, your uh, um, partner also told us that there were contacts uh, on that training with Kolaya Sepin. Now, to uh, conclude, uh, Noel, you've heard uh, the questions on uh, uh, local technologies, on the way uh, we can uh, uh, have more competitive prices uh, to uh, producers. In preliminary discussions, you told me that uh, development agencies such as GIZ uh, order the series of transformers uh, that would be used as prototypes uh, in the training of our producers. Uh, so waiting for funding, and I hope you'll get some, and uh, whilst uh, prices haven't decreased, uh, have you uh, uh, resorted to other solutions? At the start, uh, uh, bio uh, fertilizers on uh, African uh, markets are uh, way more expensive than uh, chemical uh, fertilizers. And that is the reason why we insist uh, to show farmers that they can produce their own fertilizers and cut down costs. Uh, of course, uh, the uh, price of uh, Quebec machines uh, have to go down, for, uh, but uh, we have have uh, technical problems there, and we should also shorten the uh, uh, composting uh, time, uh, which means that uh, the uh, payoff uh, duration would be short. Um, as uh, far as industrial composting activities uh, are concerned, we can, of course, uh, offer much more affordable prices on the market than uh, the current uh, uh, ag organic uh, fertilizer prices. Uh, so uh, this is uh, how we uh, manage to modulate our prices and have uh, more competitive prices uh, uh, through industrial activities. Uh, but of course, some organizations uh, uh, are pre-funding uh, the uh, activities. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so before giving the floor to Elisabeth, Emile, Christophe, uh, Charles, do you have anything to add uh, in half a minute? So I think that uh, um, uh, if we want to take up the challenges of uh, price when it comes to agroecology and uh, uh, overcome the problems of uh, performance, we should tap on uh, the potential offered by this uh, transition. We've talked about replacing uh, chemical uh, fertilizers with organic fertilizers. I think that's not the only way to go about it. We could also use bio uh, stimulants that uh, make it possible to capture many more uh, soil nutrients uh, in order to avoid resorting to um, organic uh, uh, fertilizers. We should go beyond the organic fertilizers to uh, tap into the potential of all agroecological practices like biostimulators uh, or an increase in soil health in order to meet the needs of uh, uh, farmers. Christophe? And I'd rather listen to uh, the reaction and hear the president of PAFO. Specific questions. I think you already 
had given a, a clear explanatory uh, part. So without major delay, I think, you know, part of the innovation sessions, as Fatma said at the beginning, is to give the flow to the entrepreneurs and the farmers themselves. Uh, so, uh, and then we continue the conversation afterwards. And you can, of course, uh, know more um, by, by contacting them. So without major delay now, I give the floor to Elizabeth Simadala. She is the president of the farmers, uh, of the Pan-African Farmers Organizations. As you can see, she's a woman, she's young, she's herself an agri -preneur. Actually, uh, when I knew her, she was really only a, 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 an entrepreneur, an agri um, She's also uh, the president of the Eastern African Farmers Federation. She sits in the major, hopefully, uh, giving the voice of uh, uh, small-scale farmers in the major global, continental, regional, and country-level boards in different areas, which all impact the agriculture and the, and the food sector. Uh, and she leads as well a, a very popular e-granary mobile, mobile initiative as well that aggregates farmers for input services and output markets. So thank you so much uh, for uh, being uh, with us uh, today. I know that uh, sometimes you have some challenges from Uganda uh, uh, in places where you are uh, in the countryside side. I'm very happy that today you are with us. And I, I actually, I followed with interest uh, your speeches as well at the UN uh, Food uh, Summit uh, uh, recently held. Thank you, Elizabeth. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Isolina, for the excellent introduction. I hope you can hear me well. We hear you very well. Yes, um, so I, let me start by thanking you and uh, our Korea SCP uh, friends. Uh, plus uh, the PAFO CEO and, and my colleagues for putting together these innovation series. And of course, uh, many thanks to all our distinguished participants who have kept growing in numbers. And of course, our panelists for the excellent presentations, which for me really align very well with our PAFO new strategy, which focuses on commercialization and economic service delivery while putting emphasis on climate change and, and resilience. So in terms of, uh, of takeaways from, from our today's meeting, but also um, touching a little bit on some of the processes like the UNFSS process, which has been uh, hinted on by uh, a number of speakers, I, I can say that I really see a consensus on the transition towards uh, more sustainable food systems. Uh, where focus is on preserving the natural resources and adapting to climate change. Of course, as we sustainably produce to make sure that, uh, you know, we meet the growing demand for food uh, globally and uh, also the ability to satisfy the changing consumer demands uh, for safe, for health and for nutritious diets that are really uh, traceable. I, I think we've heard from Malula Foods, from Labado, that they are targeting the EU, the USA market, but also the African markets. So we hope, um, uh, 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 you know, protocols like the Africa continental free trade area will address some of these uh, market challenges that some of the agripreneurs have highlighted. And we've also heard that, you know, markets uh, uh, shape the way uh, we produce. When you have um, a, a, a sustainable market, then produce, uh, farmers are able to, to produce. Uh, in terms of um, the, the growing consumer demand, uh, it also calls for new ways of food production. We need to feed the world without uh, destroying the planet. We also need to make sure that uh, we preserve the natural resources. We've had uh, the recycling of organic matter to get uh, organic fertilizer. We need to adopt to climate change and because of the core principles of which um, ag agroecology uh, practices are built on, um, for example, the diversity, the efficient use of natural resources, the nutrient recycling, uh, you know, the natural regulation, which also, um, you know, encompass uh, a wide variety of practices that are coherent with the key principles of environmental uh, preservation and economic uh, variability. Uh, we had um, the putting culture in the bottle a statement, uh, which was um, presented by one of the speakers. And I think for me, it really portrays a, a broader message and a, a whole a range of activities across the entire value chain. 
So what do we learn from all this? It really makes a, a great courage um, most acceptable by the different stakeholders we've had from everyone. And this is not only um, from, from the speakers we've had today, but, uh, but even globally, uh, because it is viewed as um, a means of reaching adaptation and mitigation targets. And I think this also came out clearly uh, from the presentation from, from EU, I think um, uh, Christoph and Emily, but also uh, from Charles. And um, it's also clear that um, agroecological innovations are based on the co-creation of knowledge. We've seen a lot of uh, you know, um, knowledge um, being shared by, by the different speakers, but also trying to combine uh, science with the traditional, practical, and the local knowledge of the producers. We've had um, a strong uh, emphasis on, on, on the traditional knowledge coming out um, strongly from the different speakers. So the scalability of these practices, of course, is a sure way to achieve inclusive development and that cannot as well assure us a sustainable future for our generations. And uh, from the orphan crops and how some crops have been transformed into many commodities and western into uh, other products is also another way to show that, you know, uh, agroecology can, can, can make things uh, happen. However, there has been some challenges that were highlighted. Uh, we know there are still barriers for scaling up agroecology. For example, uh, the limited access to knowledge has been touched on uh, understanding of the different approaches for environmental sustainability across uh, the different sectors and stakeholders. Uh, the aspect of research uh, also came out, uh, including the new technologies and innovations. And from, uh, from the Speakers also, uh, they highlighted that transition, of course, we require a shift in strategies, in policies, in programs and actions at different levels. Therefore, there's really a need for an enabling policy environment. And it's not only uh, the enabling policy environment, but it should also be coupled by, you know, the required subsidies and investments across the barry chain. Uh, for example, around access to, to land. Um, it has been highlighted, uh, most youth have uh, issues when it comes to access to land, but also um, access to financing, distribution, logistics, processing, equipment, uh, storage, investments for promoting um, local tourism, among uh, the many other uh, areas that were highlighted, which are all very critical. And lastly, um, uh, everyone has also recognized the need for mutual partnerships with all the value chain actors and political will at different levels to support the farmers and other private sector actors in making sure that we upscale agroecological best practices. The issue of trust is also very key and it has been well highlighted that African ecological entrepreneurs need to be trusted and we also need to focus on skilling youth, women, and putting farmers at the center of the food systems transformation to have a sustainable future. So I really want to thank uh, all of you once again for joining in and I invite you to visit our website for more information on, on our activities and I look forward to see you in our future events. Thank you and over to you, Isolina. Thank you very much, President. I mean, for the excellent, uh, actually, uh, summary uh, that we couldn't agree more with you. Thank you so much for being with us as well and for your support uh, to all these uh, series from you and your members. So now, just to keep on time a few minutes, uh, Jeremy, uh, Jeremy Knops is the uh, DG of Cole ACP, for which uh, you would have understood I work for. Uh, I mean, he's uh, very much uh, along his career, uh, before Cole ACP and at Cole ACP, working on business development certification, traceability, but always with an impact on smallholder farmers and, you know, our, our partnership with PAFO to bring farmers, entrepreneurs, you know, uh, together. Um, and of course, uh, we uh, at ACP add their fully to people, planet, profit, which is a bit, you know, uh, what we have been uh, talking very briefly today. So, Jeremy, please, some of your insights. Good morning, good afternoon, uh, good evening. Thank you, Zarina. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Uh, thank you to, to, to all panelists uh, and, and, and all participants in, in today's session. Um, and of course, thank you to our, uh, to our financial partners, the EU and, and mainly the EU and the organization of EPCP states to, to, to be able to make these events uh, also possible. Um, I'll, I'll try, of course, to be quite brief. There has been 
a lot of information uh, uh, shared, a very uh, important strategic information at different levels through different experiences and different points of, of views. Um, I, I'm just going to try and share maybe the perspective from Colisipi, huh, which is one of the perspectives and, and does not represent, of course, a, a, a standalone uh, answer to, uh, to the, um, a number of issues we were facing. So, so Colisipi were a private sector association, not for profit. And our, our, our members are, are, are quite diverse when, 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 we, when we look at them, uh, mainly involved at, at production and, and, and processing level, mainly in the fruit and veg value chain, but from very uh, small uh, uh, micro, micro enterprises, cooperatives to, to larger companies, um, some of which are already uh, very much uh, involved in, in the organic movement, others who are not. Uh, and, and following more conventional uh, agriculture, but, but they all share, I would say today, within the organization, uh, a, a common, uh, a common uh, denominator. And that extends, of course, to uh, all, the, all the structures we work with um, through the different programs we, we're managing. It's this shared vision of, 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 of moving towards, transitioning towards a more sustainable and inclusive uh, agricultural uh, model. Um, and the good news, of course, is, is, is that, that, that that's a good starting point. Um, the other good starting point is, of course, the uh, increasing international recognition of, of, uh, of the importance of moving towards a, a completely reviewed uh, uh, sustainable agri-food, uh, agricultural agri-food systems. Um, the other good news is that, yes, there are several approaches over the years uh, and different types of terminology that, that which have been used. And, Today, it appears, uh, it seems that uh, agroecology does, uh, does offer probably the, the most holistic uh, framework uh, under which and through which uh, uh, other uh, movements and other terminologies uh, uh, can, uh, can position uh, themselves. So, so those are, are kind of the, the on, on, on the positive side, on, on the challenging side, um, uh, we, we well, of course, we uh, as a network uh, and constantly through by engaging with our, our partners at PAFO and, and others, but I think we were questioning ourselves uh, quite a lot and, and echoing a bit what, what Emile, uh, Emile Frison said, um, that, that there's an urgency in terms of timing um, when, when looking at some of the required changes. Um, and, and, and there's a question of scale, uh, which can, can, can be uh, uh, pretty... Uh, which is daunting. Um, there's also a recognition of a, a very strong diversity of situations, in function of uh, very local uh, production systems, agroecological, agroclimatic conditions, crops, production systems, uh, even at, at, in some cases at national level, different types of priorities when it, when it, when it comes uh, to looking at uh, sustainable development goals. So there, there, there's a complex equation at the moment to, um, to, to, to resolve. And, and to add to that complexity, I think it has been highlighted through several uh, tes uh, uh, testimonials today. I mean, there, there's of course, we're looking at, at, at production and, and really uh, agricultural practices, but, but as a standalone, it, it's not enough. We, we need to be looking at this in terms of systems and in terms of what market, uh, what the markets and the consumers will be able to recognize and ultimately putting a, uh, a fair value on uh, on those efforts moving towards a, a, a transition. So what what we feel uh, from, from from where we stand, uh, and I think uh, all the elements have been mentioned. And, and if I just maybe want to, to highlight a couple of them, clearly that there's more to be done on, on on the policy side in terms of, uh, of course, maybe moving one step even further in terms of harmonized frameworks, but also creating the right enabling environment and the right incentives, uh, getting back to this idea of, 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 of having the incentives in place, um, or creating the conditions so that the incentives are there uh, at production level, at business level, to be able to, to make a decent level out of, 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 of a transitioning uh, uh, system. Uh, there's the importance in terms of research, research and innovation, and, and has been again highlighted that several times uh, about th this need. Of course, we, we have now a, a number of, of new solutions, new technologies, which are science and, 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 and market-based. Of course, the next question is, is, is how, to, how to upscale adoption. And, and then comes, of course, the question of funding, uh, funding uh, uh, behind that. Um, there's, of course, this question of human capital training and training not as a standalone, training over time, uh, 
uh, at all different stages of the value chain, uh, different generations. We talk a lot, of course, about the young, but there's also all the others involved in the, in, in, in the value chain. And I think it's, a, it's again, it's a holistic effort and a long-term uh, commitment to transfer the, the needed skills to move the world towards uh, more sustainable practices. There's this idea of looking into disruptive business models uh, to again bring back uh, a fair a fair recognition on on on, on at the production side, um, and 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 of course, given the complexity of the equation, uh, the, the different levels of intervention required today, uh, this can only be done through 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 partnerships and alliances, and 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 of course, it, it, and it is not easy, uh, and it is not easy to move from. Uh, the recognition of, of, of this need to do this in, in full partnership and synergy with, with everybody uh, to, to put it into practice uh, at scale and in a short period of time. So uh, being humble and also in light of the complexity that's that's ahead of us, uh, recognizing that there are huge opportunities uh, at a very operational level now, we, we feel that we, we've started uh, uh, a journey at Col ECP through, through some pragmatic tools, uh, but which goes um, towards a step-by-step -step approach, uh, building up a, a, also a business case with uh, the operator, prioritizing on the on the main areas of intervention, on, on the main priorities being on, on soil water uh, or, or, or replacing uh, a number of, of, of inputs uh, uh, or uh, more synthetic inputs with, with organic uh, uh, and, and other kind of control methods uh, on, on, on production. So we, we are on a step-by-step -step approach with some tools, with, with knowledge that's here, but, but we do face a, a challenge in, in terms of uh, having a, and I would say it's not even a linear growth in terms of impact and, uh, and dissemination. We, we're really looking into uh, the need to, to, to look more at a kind of exponential uh, uh, growth. Um, and, and, and that again, will only, will only be able to do this uh, through, through collective intelligence and, and, and sustained efforts uh, during, the next, uh, during the next decade. So thank you again for everybody to, to be here and uh, uh, looking forward uh, to to seeing you all again uh, at at the next session. Thank you, uh, everybody. Thank you, Zelina. Back to you. Yes, thank you very much. For so the interest of time, I will uh, stop here. I will thank, of course, all the teams, as uh, President of PAFO and uh, Jeremy have done from uh, PAFO and Col ECP. It's always a pleasure from my side and from my colleagues uh, to work with you. Uh, I'm uh, very interested uh, in this topic, and I think everything we have done so far contributes to the same, which is the sustainability of food systems for us and the ones that come after us. And uh, if I have a favorite sentence is the one of Nelson Mandela, which is, it always seems impossible until it's done. So it will take time, but we will. We have no choice than to get to, to uh, sustainability for all of us. Uh, Fatma, you have the last word. I thank you very much, uh, the speakers. It was a pleasure interacting with all of you and uh, thank you for keeping the time and for all your efforts. You are very busy people, all of you. And uh, you, know, you still uh, took time and, and, and stayed with us until the end. So thank you very much and see you soon. Fatma? Thank you, Isolina. I'd like to apologize uh, to our interpreters because we, we've run over a bit. Thanks for their dynamism. But I have good news, as I said at the outset, at the start of the PAYFOR, as part of its uh, AGM and as part of the parallel events that will be conducted next week, uh, rather in the week from 18 to 23rd of October. Well, during that AGM and the side events, we will be able to uh, relay the information we've been able to glean uh, through these uh, uh, innovation series meetings. We also wanted to take the opportunity uh, to give the floor to give the floor to entrepreneurs. We see that there are many comments and questions in the chat. We know that you have things to say. You want to have a voice. You've seen the comments. You've seen the questions. Uh, thanks, Axel, incidentally, for helping us with that. In your comments, you tell us, in particular, that uh, you, you have uh, uh, experiences to share. Well. You will be able to do that. There's a form for that. You can use it to record a short uh, commentary or video clip on your experience. Uh, we will have a meeting 
it will be a hybrid meeting, a face-to-face -face meeting here in Kigali, and also the meeting will be accessible online. We will get the links at a later stage through your emails. Uh, of course, this was an exceptional, this will be an exceptional session in October. We'll have, we'll have uh, more than two, uh, uh, two hours. It will be a half day meeting, but of course we will see each other again uh, uh, for the seventh session, uh, which will mark a full year of uh, the innovation series. It will be on the 18th of November. It's a Thursday at the same time, you will get an official announcement uh, efficient information through the social networks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to the interpreters. <clears throat> Thanks for PayFo and Colia CP. Thanks for the, the teams. Uh, without those teams, uh, this event would be a failure, especially if you rely on my uh, digital or technical capacity. Thank you, Gaetan and Mohamed. Thanks for the technical support. Axel. You are unique. Axel, please <laughs> turn your camera on, Axel, so that uh, people will put a face on, on your name. We'd like to thank the communication team staff, staff and Sandra, you are exceptional. And I would like to thank Isolina. Isolina, you, you really are uh, a, a strong pillar. Uh, for, uh, thank you very much. See you soon. Bye bye.